What if I told you that your drive shaft, without you knowing it, could speed up and slow down twice on every single rotation? Hey Garage Fabbers! I've talked a lot about pinion angle, pinion angle, pinion angle, pinion, 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 pinion angle on this channel. But today, we're finally going to talk about why pinion angle is so important, especially on vehicles with air suspension. And it all starts with a drive shaft, or more specifically, the universal joints in a drive shaft, sometimes referred to as cardan joints. This is a CV joint. What does it have to do with a universal joint? Nothing. And that's why I bring it up. CV stands for constant velocity. Velocity can roughly be translated as speed. The CV joint uses ball bearings in machined grooves to allow a rotating shaft to bend while maintaining a constant speed. In other words, if a motor turns this part of a CV joint at a constant speed, this part will also rotate at a constant speed. Well, duh, I'm sorry. Any joint connected to a motor will turn at the same speed as the motor, right? <laughs> there must be a reason the constant velocity joint was named the constant velocity joint. And that reason is the U-joint. The U-joint is not a CV joint. By that I mean a U-joint doesn't always rotate at a constant velocity. Instead of ball bearings like the CV joint, the U-joint uses a cross to allow flex. Because of that cross, even when attached to a motor that's turning at a constant speed, a bent U-joint drive shaft is out here doing its own thing, speeding up and slowing down, and speeding up and slowing down, and it's happening really fast. If your suspension isn't set up properly, this will shake you to death and destroy your drivetrain. I built a machine to help me demonstrate the sorcery. Honestly, I borrowed the idea of this machine from some other videos I've seen, but mine is way better, because mine has a parallel link setup to show real-time changes in a drive shaft as a modern suspension moves up and down. I've attached this thingy to my motorized bead roller which will resemble your vehicle's transmission, making the other end the differential. On this drive shaft, there are three bicycle sprockets. Those are noisemakers. They will allow you to hear any variation in speed. One is attached to the transmission tail shaft, another on the center section of the drive shaft, and the last one on the differential. To start, notice our entire drivetrain is in line with no bends, and because of that, there's nothing interesting to see or hear. That's because things don't get weird until you bend a U-joint. So, let's extend our suspension fully as if we're lifting our vehicle. That's a nice bend right there. And now check this out. The transmission is still turning at a constant speed, but the drive shaft Do you hear the pitch change? This bent U-joint is causing the drive shaft speed to oscillate. Isn't that crazy? And the oscillation is going straight into the differential. Can you imagine a car with this bent U-joint installed? I'm gonna go grab some milk. An important thing to note is that this speed oscillation increases and decreases as the U-joint angle increases and decreases. So if the drive shaft speed only oscillates when the U-joint bends, then the obvious answer is to just keep the drive shaft straight, right? In theory, yes, that would be great. But as the suspension moves up and down in a vehicle, the U-joints are going to bend and in a vehicle with adjustable height suspension, 
the U-joints are going to bend a lot. Luckily, we have a fix. You can actually cancel out the speed oscillation of this U-joint with a second U-joint. To do that, there's two requirements. One, the second U-joint needs to be installed in phase. That's a fancy term for saying that these yoke ears are in line. Or put another way, the second U-joint is positioned as a mirror image to the first. That's interesting because a mirror reverses stuff and that's exactly what we're trying to do. Reverse this wacky speed oscillation. Requirement two is the angle of that second U-joint. Remember that the speed oscillation increases the more the U-joint bends. So in order to reverse just the right amount of speed oscillation, the angles of both U-joints need to match. I'm going to zero out my angle finder to the transmission side sprocket and then adjust the differential side sprocket to match. Now the shaft inside the transmission and the shaft inside the differential are parallel. And because of that, the front and rear U-joints are bent at the same angle. Let's try it out and see what happens. The transmission is still turning at a constant speed. The drive shaft speed is still oscillating because of this bend and the differential after the second U-joint is back to constant speed. I don't know about you, but when I first learned this, it was absolute magic. So now you know the rule. Pinion angle should be parallel to the transmission shaft angle. Let's mess things up on purpose. Say someone tells you, Hey buddy, hey, you're gonna wanna set that pinion angle at three to five degrees down. Oh. Okay. Why? A brief tangent. Pinion angle refers to the angle of the input shaft inside the differential. In this video, I will be saying that the pinion angle of a differential in this position is down, and this position is up. Some folks will disagree, and they will be right. Their argument is that the shaft angles should be determined from the front of the vehicle to the back. So if this transmission is angled down and this drive shaft is angled down, then the pinion angle is also angled down. I agree. However, visually that can be confusing to someone that's just learning this stuff. And as always, it's more important to me to help you understand than it is for me to sound smart. So visually, this arrow is angled up. This symbol is angled up. This pair is angled up and this pinion angle is angled up. In the end, when you're working alone in your garage, terminology doesn't matter much if you truly understand the system. So let's continue understanding the system. So you do as you're told and set your pinion angle to three to five degrees down. The problem is that person never bothered to ask you what your transmission angle was, which in this case, it's pretty much in line with the drive shaft at zero degrees. What have you done? I'll tell you what you've done. You've created a single bent U-joint and a nasty vibration on the freeway. Here's something interesting. That guy that told you to point your pinion angle down three to five degrees may have been right once upon a time. Back in the day, muscle cars had leaf springs. High horsepower engines have the ability to twist those leaf springs a little, causing the axle and differential to rotate backwards some under heavy acceleration, maybe even three to five degrees backwards. So on leaf sprung vehicles built strictly for the drag strip, it would actually make sense to point the pinion angle down knowing the torque of the engine would pull the pinion angle up into alignment during the race. Then the vehicle would go home with a misaligned pinion angle on a trailer. With that in mind, let's add to the pinion angle rule. Pinion angle should be parallel to the transmission shaft angle as often as possible. That's an important addition because with many suspension designs, pinion angle isn't fixed. Pinion angle change is really common on production vehicle suspensions. Both my wife Caroline's Forerunner and my Mustang have similar link bar rear suspensions with long lower bars and shorter upper bars. This setup increases traction on acceleration, but the uneven length bars cause the pinion angle to change 
as the suspension moves up and down. See Suspension Basics, Episode 2. So why isn't this a problem? Because the 4Runner and the Mustang are both static height vehicles. In other words, they have a constant ride height. The manufacturer set the pinion angle parallel to the transmission shaft angle at that ride height because that's the height the vehicle will see most often. The vehicle will probably hit a bump or a dip at some point and the ride height will change momentarily. When that happens, the pinion angle will also be misaligned momentarily, but it's likely so minimal and so brief that you wouldn't notice it and it certainly wouldn't cause any parts to fail. It's not until we custom car enthusiasts start messing with things that problems arise. Say Caroline decides to lift her 4Runner 6 inches and I decide to drop my Mustang into the weeds. Now that our ride heights are different, our likely misaligned pinion angles are permanent. Now you might feel the vibration at higher speeds and you will also start wearing out the drive shaft U-joints more quickly. So, what would be the fix? With the vehicle resting at its new height, not on a lift, you should check to see if your pinion angle matches the transmission shaft angle. If it does, great, leave it alone. If it doesn't, you might need to install either aftermarket adjustable length link bars or some wedge-shaped blocks between your leaf springs and axle that will allow you to put your pinion angle back into alignment. I wanna install air hydraulics on my truck. It's gonna be sweet. How do I set my pinion angle? I am glad you asked. If you haven't noticed, air suspension is my favorite topic. If your vehicle will be able to drive at a one inch ride height, a 10 inch ride height, and everything in between, pinion angle is something you're really gonna wanna pay attention to. If you're bagging something with unequal length bars, like the 4Runner, or even some aftermarket link bar kits, pinion angle misalignment is going to happen and managing it is going to be a balancing act. You can approach it two ways. One, you can determine what your total travel will be and set your pinion angle to the correct position at half travel. This will minimize the pinion angle misalignment at both maximum and minimum ride heights. Two, or what I would suggest, install an air management system that will allow you to set the desired ride height, adjust your pinion angle to that ride height, and stick to that ride height. This will operate the same as the factory setup, except now you can drop your vehicle on the ground when you park, and the occasional drag sesh probably won't hurt anything. If you want to bag something that came with leaf springs, like the Mighty Max, you're probably going to want to ditch those leaf springs and install some link bars instead. And this is your opportunity to never have to worry about pinion angle again. If you install a parallel forelink or a triangulated forelink that uses the parallel forelink principles, once you set your pinion angle, it will stay at that angle at all ride heights. You can see that magic in my video Suspension Basics Episode 2. Or you can see it right now because there's a parallel link setup on my doohickey. Watch how the equal length and parallel bars cause the differential to maintain the same angle as the transmission. And even though the speed of the drive shaft varies, the speed of the differential does not. Hopefully things are clicking for you because things are about to get confusing. Inevitably, somebody is gonna hit me up in the comments and ask, what about the double card on joint? So I'll be proactive and install one on my machine. People often call this a constant velocity joint. Uh, I realize I just went on a tangent about how terminology isn't important, but this is a CV joint, not this. A double cardan joint is exactly what the name says it is. It's two cardan joints, or two U-joints, put together. A double cardan joint takes all the magic that we just learned about and puts it in a neat little package. The speed oscillation is still there. It's just confined to the center section, which is essentially just a really short drive shaft. A double cardan joint is handy on vehicles with rapidly changing pinion angle, like on vehicles with a two-link suspension. Think old Chevy C10s and NASCAR. With a two-link, the rear joint on the drive shaft will maintain relatively straight, while the front joint 
bends. Again, not a big deal with minimal movement of a static height to link, but a very big deal if you decide to increase the amount of travel with air springs. Because a single bent U-joint equals vibrations. Since only the front joint bends on a two-link, installing a double carden joint on the front of the drive shaft would prevent any vibration. So, should a double carden joint be installed on every adjustable suspension? Definitely not. A double carden joint both creates and eliminates its own speed oscillation, but it does not eliminate the oscillation from other bent U joints on the drive shaft. For example, on a parallel four link, the front and rear joints of the drive shaft will be bent at the same angle. The singular U joint will create an oscillation. But if you install a double carden joint on one side, that joint will create and eliminate its own speed oscillation, but it does not eliminate the oscillation from other bent U-joints. Think of a bent U-joint as a light switch that turns on and off vibration. If you add a single bent U-joint, you just flip the switch and turned on the vibration. Add a second U-joint bent to the same angle to turn it back off. If you add a third bent U-joint, you just turned on the vibration again, and so on. That said, an even number of equally bent U-joints is necessary to prevent driveshaft vibration. An odd number of bent U-joints just might vibrate. So, on that vehicle with one carden joint and one single U-joint, that's technically three U-joints and a potential vibration maker. Yo, Humpty got a Tacoma with a two-piece driveshaft and three singular U-joints. How come that one don't wiggle? Because with a two-piece drive shaft, the first U-joint doesn't bend. The transmission is fixed and the carrier bearing is fixed, which keeps the first U-joint straight. And a straight U-joint doesn't oscillate. The second piece of the drive shaft, however, moves up and down with the rear suspension. And both of the rear U-joints flex about the same amount, which again creates and eliminates the speed oscillation before it gets to the differential. Here's a quick side note for those of you considering using a double carden joint on their project. Some people think that the two U-joints in a double carden joint will allow a drive shaft to flex more. It does not. There's less flex actually. The front and rear flanges in a double carden joint are connected in the middle. That ensures the two U-joints bend an equal amount. Because remember, Equal bends are needed to prevent vibration, but this connection also greatly limits the movement of a double carden joint. So remember my friends, when building your suspension, plan to keep your pinion angle and your transmission shaft angle parallel as often as possible and keep moving forward. Seven months ago, I was feeling a little overwhelmed. Okay, a lot overwhelmed and I decided to take a break from YouTube. During those seven months, I received a bunch of messages from people to encourage me to take as much time as I needed, but that they miss the Garage Fab content. In that time off, 7,000 more people subscribed even though there wasn't any signs of new material coming. That's a total of 20,000 Garage Fab subscribers. It was a bit of an eye-opening realization that people really care and they value what we create here. So I'm glad to be back at it. A very genuine thank you to all the viewers for your support and the much needed motivation to continue. My friends, garage fabbers, I'll see you in the next one.